Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? No one can hear me. Okay. All right, there we go. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Harris. I'm director of the James Monroe Museum. We welcome you to today's festivities, which will begin with music from the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. Well, thank you, and uh, good morning. Thank you for having us at this uh, special event to commemorate the anniversary of President Monroe's inauguration. Uh, as you mentioned, we are from the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. We're your neighbors from up in Al um, Arlington, just up the way a little bit. Uh, one of the unique things about our unit is we do obviously harken back to the uh, late 1700s in our appearance and our musical repertoire. What we'd like to do for you this morning is give you a, a short snippet of um, actually what trumpet groups would have done literally during the uh, colonial era and the early years of our nation for events really pretty much like this. Um, you would often have a small group of trumpeters playing tunes to celebrate, to kick things off, to get things going. That's one of the unique things about our job is we get to do what our predecessors did um, you know, several hundred years ago. So it's, it's fun for us. Uh, so that's what we'll start with this morning. Just a couple of trumpet tunes that are actually from the 16 to 1700s and hopefully set the mood a little bit for us. Thank you. 
switching forward to more contemporary use of field music or martial music, uh, we'll actually now incorporate the fifes over here and do some things that are out of our current repertoire from the Fife and Drum Corps, uh, more typical of what you might see us doing in a parade these days or on a military ceremony. Still using martial instruments, military instruments inspired of those from the 17, 1800s now. Um, we'd like to play two sequences that are uh, part of our standard repertoire for military ceremonies and parades.
Ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to today's event. I am Scott Harris, director of the James Monroe Museum. And before we proceed, can we once again show our appreciation for the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps? <laughs> the museum is proud to present today's program commemorating the 200th anniversary of the inauguration of James Monroe as the fifth president of the United States. There are some acknowledgments that I would like to make, and uh, I'll ask you to hold your applause until I get through a few groups of folks here. We appreciate the generous support of this and other public programs that the museum puts on each year uh, from our sponsors, the names of whom you will find in today's event program as well as in the schedule card of museum events going on for the first half of this year. If you've not obtained these items yet today, Look for our staff or volunteers who are wearing white hats, like the good guys they are, over here to the left, actually, right now. And speaking of the staff, I am very grateful to the museum's public programs coordinator, Linda Allen, to our office and store manager, Tracy DeMenard, our curator, Jared Kearney, as well as our other staff members, interns, and volunteers for all that they have done to prepare for this unique experience. And finally, in the program for today's event, you will also find listed living history organizations and individuals that are providing civilian and military interpreters. Please show your appreciation for our program sponsors and the folks who are helping bring today's event to life. It is now my privilege to read a proclamation from the governor of Virginia. By virtue of the authority vested by the Constitution of Virginia in the Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, there is hereby recognized James Monroe Presidential Inauguration Bicentennial Day. Whereas James Monroe, a native of Westmoreland County, Virginia, fought for American liberty during the Revolutionary War, rising in rank from lieutenant to lieutenant colonel, and surviving a life-threatening wound at the Battle of Trenton, on December 26, 1776, and whereas James Monroe served the Commonwealth of Virginia successively as a member of the House of Delegates, Council of State, and Virginia Ratifying Convention for the United States Constitution, and as Governor of the Commonwealth and President of the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1829, and whereas James Monroe served the United States of America successfully, successively as a Virginia delegate to the Congress of the Confederation, United States Senator, American Minister to France, Great Britain and Spain, Secretary of State and Secretary of War, and whereas James Monroe was elected the fifth President of the United States in 1816, becoming the fourth of eight Virginians elected to the nation's highest office, and whereas James Monroe was inaugurated on March 4, 1817, before the building known as the Old Brick Capitol, used as the temporary seat of the United States Congress from 1814 to 1819, becoming the first president to be inaugurated out of doors. And whereas the inauguration of James Monroe commenced an administration of two terms, during which the states of Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama, Maine, and Missouri were admitted to the Union, the United States acquired Florida from Spain by treaty. The Missouri Compromise was enacted as a response to the growing sectional conflict over the issue of slavery. The United States recognized new Latin American republics that gained their independence from Spain. And through his annual message to Congress on December 2, 1823, President Monroe promulgated an American policy barring European intervention in the affairs of nations in the Western Hemisphere known to history thereafter as the Monroe Doctrine, and whereas recognition of the bicentennial of the inauguration of James Monroe is respectfully recommended by institutions dedicated to preserving and interpreting his legacy, James Monroe Museum and papers of James Monroe in the city of Fredericksburg, James Monroe's Highland in Albemarle County, the county of Westmoreland, and the James Monroe Memorial Foundation in the city of Richmond, now, therefore, I, Terrence R. McAuliffe, do hereby recognize March 4th, 2017, as James Monroe Presidential Inauguration Bicentennial Day in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I call this observance 
to the attention of all our citizens. Please join me in expressing thanks to Governor McCullough for this proclamation. The James Monroe Museum was given to the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1964, and today is administered by the University of Mary Washington. As an employee and an alumnus of the university, I am particularly pleased that we are gathered today on this campus in front of this building, our oldest building at the university, that is named for James Monroe. It's my honor now to introduce the 10th president of the University of Mary Washington, whose own inauguration will take place on April 21st, Dr. Troy D. Pena. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the University of Mary Washington. It's certainly uh, my honor to be with you here today for this very special occasion. Uh, I was reading the uh, program under the auspices of a delightful day, and I think we certainly got a delightful day here. Uh, we are very proud of our association with uh, President Monroe and, and the museum, uh, and are certainly honored to be here to celebrate and recognize an individual who played such an important role in our representative democracy at a place, at a university, that I also believe has had a very special role in place in our representative democracy. So I welcome you here today. I, uh, I hope you enjoy today's ceremonies. It's an honor. I look forward to enjoying this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Paino. James Monroe had many ties to Fredericksburg, from his upbringing in nearby Westmoreland County to his later residence here as a young attorney and legislator. Please join me now in welcoming the Honorable Mary Catherine Greenlaw, the 85th mayor of the city of Fredericksburg, who will de deliver a welcome from the city. Thank you. Good morning and a good day it is indeed. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome you to the celebration of the anniversary of the inaugural of our fifth president and one of Fredericksburg's most illustrious citizens. Jason Rowe established his residence and law practice in Fredericksburg in October of 1786. At that time, Fredericksburg offered a young attorney a much better opportunity than Richmond or Washington, where there were many lawyers practicing their trade. From this base, Monroe was able to follow the seasonal circuit of court dates around central and western Virginia. Here, he and his wife, Elizabeth Courtright Monroe, would welcome their first child on December 5, 1786. <clears throat> the house in which they live still stands at 301 Caroline. His law office at 908 Charles was established as a museum in 1927 by his great-granddaughter, Rose Duchene Gouverneur Hughes, and her son, Lawrence Gouverneur Hughes. Here also, James Monroe continued his political career. He was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates from Spotsylvania County in April of 1787. On July 11th of that year, he was appointed to the Fredericksburg Common Council. Prior to that, he had served in the House of Delegates from King George, the Virginia Council of State, the forerunner of our Senate, the U.S. Continental Congress, all of which were excellent preparation for his role as a city councilor. Thank you for joining us today in celebrating this great president to whom we owe much as a nation. Thank you, Mayor Greenlaw. We are now we're going off the program a little bit now, so we're improvising here. We are further honored to have with us today Delegate Robert D. Oruck, Sr., who represents the 54th District in the Virginia House of Delegates to offer remarks. Delegate Oruck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I know it's a little cold, but good morning. We can go with this. Good morning. Isn't this a glorious day? A little on the chippy side, but beautiful sunshine, and made all the more glorious for the reason we're here assembled today. And that is to remember a part of our ancestry, a part of our heritage. Remember what it meant 200 years ago to be an American, 
Because if we lose sight of that, we lose sight of what it means to be an American today. And I especially want to commend all of you who are here with some, some of the children, because that is even more critical, I think, for them, that in today's world with the media and all the distractions, for them to have an understanding and appreciation for our governmental roots of representative democracy. I extend my appreciation to Mr. Harrison and Dr. Pano in particular, and all others who are responsible for putting this ceremony together here today, because it is critical for all of us to understand that our founding fathers created a government with conflicting ideals, whereby they had to come to compromise in order to give us the representative democracy that has lasted for so long. But in that process of compromise on how to affect a government, they never lost sight of the fact that the role of government is to ensure freedom for our population, a voice in government matters, and a prosperous future for us and for all our children. As we gather here today to hear the remarks, hopefully he'll arise shortly in carriage, of our president-elect, President Monroe, I'm incredibly humbled, especially given that there was a tenure in his career where he also represented the county of Spotsylvania in our Virginia General Assembly, which I've been so honored to do for so many years. It is indeed a humbling experience to be part of this ceremony here today. I commend each and every one of you for coming out and being a part of this. And may God bless you and God bless our country. Thank you, Delegate Orr. And last but certainly not least, we will hear from Christopher Snyder, District Representative for Congressman Dave Brown of Virginia's 7th District. Mr. Snyder. Good morning. <clears throat> I have uh, written my remarks as if today were March 4th, 1817, to have a historical perspective. <clears throat> Good morning, President and First Lady Madison, President-elect and First Lady Monroe, Chief Justice Marshall, and distinguished guests. It is an honor to recognize two great Americans and Virginians who were instrumental in founding our republic. As you know, President-elect Monroe initially opposed ratification of our Constitution until President Madison introduced his amendments, now known as the Bill of Rights. These amendments protect American citizens in the face of a centralized government and grant authority to the states not expressly given to the branches of the federal government. Uh, President-elect Monroe has served as Secretary of State for the past eight years under President Madison, uh, as well as serving as Secretary of War. It is with a hopeful eye to the future that I welcome President Monroe to lead our republic, and it is with a sense of gratitude that I say thank you to President and First Lady Madison for a lifetime of service as they return home to Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Now, I will ask everyone, if you have not already done so, to silence your cell phones. The people from the past are not going to know what it is, and it will frighten them. We do want to preserve as much of the historic ambiance of the moment as we can. The inauguration of the President of the United States is one of the enduring rituals of American democracy. Ever since George Washington took the very first presidential oath of office in New York City, on April 30th, 1789, this ceremonial cycle has been a familiar milestone of our political process. And it's also a reflection of often conflicting forces in our society, continuity and change, compassion and prejudice, fear and hope. As the highest elected official in our republic, the president is invested with awesome powers and equally awesome responsibilities. Thus, the ceremony that marks the start of a term is replete with pomp and circumstance. James Monroe's inauguration as the fifth president on March 4, 1817, was the eighth such ceremony since 1789, but it was not a routine event. Monroe's inaugural was the first to occur after the War of 1812. And just as the presidential election of 1816 
proved that our nation's political process could withstand war and its aftermath. So too did the ensuing inauguration, which took place in a capital city, still repairing the damage caused by the British Army in August of 1814. I now ask you to employ your imaginations to travel in space and time to First and A Streets in Washington, D.C. on March 4th, 1817. It is a Tuesday. You're standing before a brick building that is barely two years old in which the Congress is meeting while the permanent capital is being rebuilt. It is an extremely fine and exhilarating day, unseasonably warm for March. I did say you would have to use your imagination. <laughs> it was a good thing, though, it was unseasonably warm because this inauguration, unlike the previous seven, is to be held out of doors. That wasn't the original plan. Following established precedent, James Monroe and his vice president, Daniel Tompkins, who were considered guests of the Senate, are supposed to be sworn in in the House of Representatives chamber. However, in the days leading up to Mr. Monroe's inauguration, a conflict has arisen between the House and the Senate. The issue? Chairs. The Senate wanted to bring their fine red chairs into the House, while the latter body insisted on using their plain Democratic chairs, which one suspects could have been blue. Unable to resolve this crisis that threatened to tear the Republic asunder, the decision was made to hold today's ceremony outside. With patriotic music in the air, citizens dressed in their finest clothes, and soldiers, sailors, and Marines at the ready, our ceremony begins with the presentation of the colors. Will everyone who is currently seated please rise? And color guard, you may post the colors.
I should be destitute of feeling if I was not deeply affected by the strong proof which my fellow citizens have given me of their confidence in calling me to the high office whose functions I am about to assume. As the expression of their good opinion of my conduct in the public service, I derive from it a gratification which those who are conscious of, I, of having done all they could do to merit alone can feel. That sensibility is increased by a just estimate of the importance of the trust and of the nature and extent of its duties. With the proper discharge of which the highest interests of a great and free people are intimately concerned or connected. Conscious of my own deficiency, I cannot enter on these duties without greater anxiety for the results. From a just responsibility, I will never shrink. The government has been in the hands of the people. To the people, therefore, and to the faithful, able depositories of their trust is the credit due. Had the people of the United States been educated in different principles, had they been less intelligent, less independent, less virtuous, can it be believed that we should have maintained the same steady and consistent career or been blessed with the same success? While then the constituent body retains its present sound and healthful state, everything will be safe. They will choose competent and faithful representatives for every department. Let us by all wise and constitutional measures promote intelligence among the people as the best means of preserving our liberties. Dangers from abroad are not less deserving of attention. Our distance from Europe and the just, moderate, and pacific policy of our government may form some security against these dangers, but they ought to be anticipated and guarded against. National honor is national property of the highest value. The sentiment in the mind of every citizen is national strength. It ought, therefore, to be cherished. Other interests of high importance will claim attention, among which the improvement of our country by roads and canals, proceeding always with a constitutional sanction, holds a distinguished place. By thus facilitating the intercourse between the states, we shall add much to the convenience and comfort of our fellow citizens, much to the ornament of our country, and what is of greater importance, we shall shorten distances, and by making each part more accessible to and dependent on the other, we shall bind the union more closely together. With the Indian tribes, it is our duty to cultivate friendly relations and to act with kindness and liberality in all our transactions. Equally proper is to persevere in our efforts to extend to them all the advantages of civilization. Peace is the best time for improvement and preparation of every kind. It is particularly gratifying for me to enter on the discharge of these duties at a time when the United States are blessed with peace. It is a state most consistent with their prosperity and happiness. It will be my sincere desire to preserve it so far as it depends on the executive. Equally gratifying is to witness the increased harmony of opinion which pervades our union. Discord does not belong to our system. 
The American people have encountered together great dangers and sustained severe trials with success. They constitute one great family with a common interest. To promote this harmony in accord with the principles of our Republican government and in a manner to give them the most complete effect and to advance in all other respects the best interest of our union will be the object of my constant and zealous exertions. Never did a government commence under auspices so favorable, nor ever was success so complete. If we look to the history of other nations, ancient or modern, we find no example of a growth so rapid, so gigantic, of a people so prosperous and happy. In contemplating what we still have to perform, the heart of every citizen must expand with joy when he reflects on how near our government has approached to perfection. That in respect to it, we have no essential improvement to make. That the great object is to preserve it in the essential principles and features which characterize it. And that is to be done by preserving the virtue and enlightening the minds of the people. If we persevere in the career which we've advanced so far and in the path already traced, we cannot fail under the favor of a gracious providence to attain the high destiny which seems to await us. In the administrations of the illustrious men which have preceded me in this high station, with some of whom I have been connected by the closest ties from early life, examples are presented which will always be highly instructive and useful to their successors. From these, I shall endeavor to derive all the advantages which they may afford. Of my immediate predecessor, under whom so important a portion of this great and successful experiment has been made, I shall be pardoned for expressing my earnest wishes that he may long enjoy in his retirement the affections of a grateful country, the best reward of exalted talents and the most faithful and meritorious service. Relying on the aid to be derived from the other departments of the government, I enter on the trust to which I have been called by the suffrages of my fellow citizens with my fervent prayers to the Almighty that he will be graciously pleased to continue to us that protection which he has already so conspicuously displayed in our favor. I thank you. Colonel James Monroe, are you ready to take the constitutional oath of office? I do, sir. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, James Monroe, do solemnly swear. I, James Monroe, do solemnly swear. To faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. To faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Let all patriotic citizens salute our new president with hearty huzzas. Three cheers for James Monroe, president of the United States of America. Huzzah! 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 Huzzah!
ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Please join us inside for refreshments in, appropriately, Monroe Hall. <laughs>